Well, the first official vote of 2019 pitted space squids, superpowered monkeys, a planet of savages, and aliens and nuclear apocalypse, Russian edition, and the answer was astoundingly resolute. After covering the nuclear apocalypse of a 1950s inspired alternate timeline America, we crossed the pond to a place of snow and vodka where we are Putin things into a more Russian perspective. Ah? Uh, ah? Uh, no? Alright, throw in the meme. There. Now laugh! Laugh! Laugh for Mother Russia! Now that we've broken the ice, we are finally taking things out of an American perspective, considering most Doomsday movies, books, games, and other media show what is going on in America. So it's a bit refreshing to check out the other side of the world. This week, we cover the Fallout Communism Edition, Darth Vader's Irradiated Twin, This is Bad Country, Don't Fire Till You See the Whites of Its Eyes, a scenario you did not see coming, the music scene here is totally underground, moldy popcorn that really pops, the evil incarnation of the spirit bomb, rats and wolves and bears and my dead uncle oh my attempting to google it will give you a lesson in metrosexuality completely awesome look at post-nuclear russian life itself this week we tell you why you wouldn't survive metro's post-apocalyptic wasteland in the year 2013, oh shit, this already happened, two unnamed Middle Eastern countries launched 20,000 nuclear warheads at each other, triggering a response from both countries' allied nations. Countries across the world shot forth their nuclear arms, crossing the paths of countless weapons of mass destruction. It is most likely within this universe that America had fired a good portion of nuclear weapons at Russia because of pre-existing opposition. Regardless of who fired at whom, a majority of the world was plunged into nuclear hellfire. This worldwide bombardment would soon be widely referred to as World War III or the Great War of 2013, since World War I was commonly referred to as the Great War considering it was the biggest world conflict in history up until World War II. For a majority of the population in the Northern Hemisphere, I say Northern Hemisphere because it's usually the countries within these regions of the world flaunting around nuclear arms. Countries like South Africa, Brazil, and Australia have other issues to deal with, mostly the toxic dust bowl blowing around irradiated spores and material worldwide after we bomb the shit out of each other. But the people up north will have fled into bomb shelters, armored tanks, safety bunkers, or underground tunnels and railroads to avoid the nuclear blasts. Sorry, no vaults in this universe. You would have to be one of the early people amongst the panicking crowd to get into one of these metro tunnels before military and security personnel would have to block you from entry due to capacity concerns. Once the doors of all the safe havens close, it was instant flash death for those above ground or in well enough safety. While a good majority of the people survived the initial explosions of the deadliest weapons known to man, it was the aftermath that took the largest count in the death toll. Surprisingly, billions of people managed to survive the blast, but nuclear winter proved to be a challenge a large majority of humanity would not be able to weather. The nukes intoxicating the air, blocking out the sun, and irradiating large amounts of land, water, and wildlife. Plants could not gain the nutrition of the sun, and if they weren't killed off by the nukes and radiation, the halting of the photosynthetic process sure did. The air being so radiation filled, only a few moments of exposure would prove lethal, and for those staying below ground, rations would run thin, leading to riots and starvation of the masses. Although the radiation did mutate a large number of remaining plants, animals, and even humans that survived. Some chemical attacks, like those detonated over Warsaw, the capital of Poland, weren't nearly as destructive. However, it did release extreme amounts of radiation that tortured all those within its radius as humans and animals slowly melted into into a pile of goo while plants were cindered into a black dust. Some areas did experience acid rain becoming another threat in warm weather, corroding metals, woods, and organic matter with each shower. Since living on the surface of this irradiated planet is out of the question, even with adequate proper hazmat suits and oxygen supplies, living with intricate tunnel systems known as the metros will be the only option for long-term survival. With how immediate the evacuation was to the metros, the amount of supplies were thinned out. Guns would mostly be newly made, with pre-war gun manufacturers scrounging together few old world guns while creating new types of submachine guns from what materials were available. The only live animals for meats that were brought underground were pigs and chickens, becoming the most common food sources, as you can see in most settlements owning multiple pig pens. However, eating all these animals would exhaust their food supply before they could reproduce more. So, the metro civilizations would also make do with eating mushrooms, rats, and sometimes potatoes if a group 
group established a greenhouse. So if you are vegan, get ready for an all-mushroom diet if your area doesn't have a tater hut, aka a greenhouse. If you're not into pigs or have some restrictions on eating it because it's dirty, well, I think just about everything you'll be eating from there on out is going to be a bit filthy. Water filtration is a thing, but purifiers aren't how you'll be keeping hydrated. The typical method of boiling water will be the way to go, as well as a type of fermented shroom vodka to keep you a little blitzed. Medical treatments would vary depending on how well off your section of the metros are. If you have an infection from a rusty metal cut or being born with a detrimental bodily defect, supplies may be slim to none. Considering some areas would be more fortified, wealthy, or just have well-armed personnel who took what they could by force, it would depend on your well-being and security. With the lack of supplies and imminent danger looming over the survivors, bullets and ammunition were an even more important commodity. Important enough to actually become a currency to trade goods and services with. The 5.45 39mm cartridges being the prominent currency amongst all types of ammunition due to their stopping power, but more importantly, how difficult it was to counterfeit this specific ammunition in mass numbers. You will basically live in a world where money is deadly. Well, even more so. But that is just living a life in the most safe manner possible. But there are always needs to venture out further into the metro tunnels to scavenge for supplies, traversing them maybe by railway car to reach other settlements, or to go to the surface in order to maybe find procurements, fixed communications, or other above ground necessities. Or to maybe even establish contact with further regions. First off, when it comes to any apocalyptic scenario, there is always the other threat of other people. The most prominent of these factions being the Commonwealth of the Stations of the Ring Line, or the Hansa, basically keeping order among sovereign stations, regulating trade points, and bolstering a force of four to five thousand soldiers. They are basically the closest form of government, considering how many sanctions and threats they administer on a regular basis. However, disregarding their rules could result in being fired upon or imprisonment. The Ranger of the Order, in which Metro's main character Artium aligns with, act as a veritable police force, or Spartan protectors as they like to call themselves within the metro and are quick to kill any hostile forces considering the violent factions and creatures that adorn these tunnels. They usually originate from the polis and work in a morally gray area. Now the polis being a veritable library of Alexandria that contains multitudes of pre-war technology, literature, and overall knowledge that all factions acknowledge as a necessity to not tarnish even with the most violent factions. That way humanity can progress no matter who is leading. It also resides in the center of the metro system and would cause catastrophic consequences for trade to all if it was destroyed. In a society where tunnels are the only way to reach each other, choking out the centerpiece of this network would prove to harm everyone in the long run, especially considering what kind of knowledge would be needed to continue as a society and also the trade routes that would be completely destroyed if this was done. One of the most dangerous groups rising from the smoldering ashes of the Nazi idealism, the Fourth Reich, did emerge after the bomb fell, led by a new Fuhrer who rejuvenated the policies of Adolf Hitler into scared, weak, and bewildered civilians, promoting racism, and now with the advent of mutants, xenophobia, by making sure all of their members are genetically pure. No radiation is going to be in your system. Suspected mutation. No, no, I'm normal. See, two arms, two legs, ten fingers. Don't you understand? I'm a Hansa citizen. Shut up! You're not in Hansa. Here, you are a suspect in the distribution of corrupted genes, and this is your trial. If your skull has the correct proportions, you are free to go. If not, you are an abomination. They train their soldiers of between two to 3,000 extensively with high-tech and weaponry, actively fighting all factions they oppose on a regular basis. If you're not deemed fit enough to be within their perfect world order or reject their ideals even slightly, they will most likely execute you on the spot. Alongside idealisms that were dominant in the yesteryears of Russia and Europe, the mentalities of communist Russia were also the Red Line, whose members idolized Stalin, Lenin, and Karl Marx, possessing the Red Line of the the metro, hence the namesake, the oldest and most nostalgic area to revel in their glory days, the group bolsters a population of 15,000, half of which are somewhat trained in armed combat. This group will often quarrel and be feuding violently with the Fourth Reich. However, more so, a military leader in their group, Corbett, sieged and took control of the D6 governmental facility in order to use biological weapons to seize control of the entire metro. Yeah, he's gonna be fighting dirty with dirty bombs. The reason I bring up these factions in somewhat detail is that in order 
order to survive, you would need to ally with one of these societies in order to just get by. Falling in line with the ideologies of either the final solution of the Fourth Reich, the controlling, censoring, and repression of the Red Line, the militarism of the Rangers of the Order, or being a security officer or civilian in the Commonwealth. This will be a condensed version of world events crammed into a dank tunnel system, fighting humans as you can and surviving the best you can against others, and the even more deadly creatures creeping beyond the lights of society. Survival in numbers is the only way of existing in this world, lest ye be devoured, slaughtered, or irradiated. Lurking within the metro system, you will find a litany of critters that wouldn't hesitate to flatline you, with the most common type being the Nozalis. Bipedal animals derived most likely from moles or even reptiles are extremely territorial and aggressive, who attack with shredding teeth and claws, but are primarily a threat as they travel and huddle in large herds. Their primary way of death dealing is just simply mauling you to death with their razor sharp fangs and claws. The normal versions can handle a few standard rounds of ammunition, however they come in varying shapes and sizes. Darker and green variants being able to soak up a hell of a lot more damage and dish out even more, as with the female versions of the drones in Gears of War, the female of the Nozalis just tend to be more deadly, especially with the Rhino. Younger versions of these gals will sprout wings and move around at an even faster pace and unleash sonic blasts. That's right, they scream loud enough to pretty much disorient you. They use these sonic blasts to stun and dizzy you long enough to execute the kill. Once either matured or battle-hardened enough, the alpha of these females will progress enough to become a Rhino, able to lead packs of Nozalis and with their sheer mass will charge at enemies like a rhino. And then we do have the spider bugs, giant spider scorpion hybrids that will also try to poison and ensnare you for a feast. But thankfully, they can actually be killed if you shine light on them long enough. They are pretty easy to take care of. If you're in a well-lit place or settlement, you won't even be bothered by them. But if the power goes out and you're down a flashlight or stuck in a dark dank place, you may be saying... Lurkers are basically fearsome rats that work like the mole rats from the Fallout universe, burrowing to ambush prey, but tend to only come out of hiding when people aren't staring at their holes. They are much like rats and are hard to pinpoint as they scurry around, attacking and hastily retreating to the personally made burrows. Within concentrated radiation compounds like the ones found in D6, even more science experiments gone wrong will exist to exterminate you. A gigantic biomass, an abomination of humanity with tentacles producing psychoactive waves, will be protecting the reactor core and they use these psychoactive waves to lure in man and beast alike, forcing them to submerge themselves into its goop and then they will slowly deteriorate into their, well, biomass and they're going to be doing that a la the blob style. The creature also produces giant amoebas that flock in large numbers to hostile nearby personnel and explode. Rising to the upper crust of Earth, the surface will give home to the most deadly creatures of the entire franchise on top of ungodly amounts of radiation. <laughs> Now, watchers devolved from canines and act pretty much like wolves do when hunting for prey, howling when they wish to congregate or spot potential food. Their jaw lines are more pronounced and powerful, allowing for a more tearing bite. The human animal, or hum animal, however you want to pronounce it, is basically a more social and intelligent version of Fallout's feral ghouls who will hide themselves in sand to ambush survivors and are seen to use basic tools as weapon. So they relatively do have more intelligence, but aren't like the ghouls that are prone to being more civil. Some irradiated plants can also showcase an aura of violence to the degree close enough to Half-Life's barnacle. The liana dangle from ceilings, but instead of dragging you into a gaping maw, they will simply just whip you to death. However, the tentacle can easily be dispersed with just one shot from most types of firearms. But beyond these mostly animalistic and plant-like entities lie creatures that seem more fiction than fact. Like the librarian, mimicking the mannerisms of a silverback gorilla, this hulking beast had primate levels of intelligence being able to to set rudimentary traps, read at a very diminished level, and most importantly, extremely territorial and combative nature. Much like gorillas, they will stare you down and try to make direct eye contact with you. But in this case, the librarian demands to make eye contact, while gorillas see it as a challenge if you do meet eyes with them. If in any way, shape, or form you break the eye contact with a librarian, they will immediately consider you a threat and attack without restriction. At this point, you are fighting a gorilla with armor plating, able to withstand numerous shotgun rounds and even grenades. Have fun being ripped in two, brother. And probably the most fearsome, deadly, and overall just terrifying bat-like leviathan is the demon.
No, not that Skyrim dragon reused asset from 76, this guy. Their genetic origin being unknown, most would assume it's just an irradiated bat, but also showing the leg characteristics of canines and felines as well. Regardless, its poor eyesight makes it rely on not echolocation, but enhanced forms of smell. If you're out in the open of the surface, this guy will either rip you in half, rip you apart, or sink its talons into you, fly you high in the air, and drop you as you fall to your death. Regardless, if he gets a hold of you, and you're out in the open, you're a dead boy or a girl. Interestingly enough, amongst the animal-like hordes resides the primary mutated antagonist of the Metro franchise, the Dark Ones. Former human beings that transformed from high amounts of radiation and survived becoming alien-like radiation-resistant creatures. Although they look like they would be a dangerous threat, they're actually a peace-seeking race of mutants that are proficient in telepathy and psychokinesis. All of which share one mind, they do have a collective consciousness, using their capabilities to turn people mad just by being in their close proximity, invoke a person's greatest fears, and watch them flee or turn on others, or be able to destroy an individual's mind just by simply trying to communicate with them. Considering they can only communicate with telepathy, they cannot speak. They wish to create peace between them and humans as they are pacifists who lost the understanding of using and creating technology, but were given a heavy blow when humans destroyed their nest via missile strike. So relationships thinned out heavily, having only Artium to rely on as the the chosen one due to his immunity to their mental abilities. They have been able to transcend their physical forms and even project themselves as ghosts, which may lie into the afterlife of this world. There are even beings that defy the very laws of science or nature. Radiation can't even explain these. Ghosts of recently deceased may be discovered trying to reach the afterlife, although lost souls who wander the metros mostly unaware their demise like the damned souls who drag the living down with them in their denial. However, these specters could be byproducts of the dark ones and other mutants using their psychic abilities to manipulate humans into killing themselves, others, or distracting the remaining masses. There is also sightings of a giant blue ball of light known as the Anomaly, which will also be found hovering around the tunnels, and if approached closely enough, will instantaneously send millions of volts coursing through your system, causing immediate death. It's unknown if it's a supernatural occurrence or a freak assembly of randomly occurring conditions, but regardless, do not get anywhere near this ball. I realized I discussed a large amount amount of creatures, but it's to display just how screwed you are. Surviving the nuclear blast, lasting with whatever resources you and those around you have for years during the fallout of the bombs, relying on the accountability and trustworthiness of other people and factions with their true intentions being magnified by the decaying and restructuring of law and order, and then living day to day with the advent of mutants, psychic beings, and even just magnified animals that could 1,000 ways to die you. I drew comparisons to the Fallout universe a few times, and it's reasonable since the original writers of the Metro since the original writer of the Metro literature admitted to drawing inspiration from the Fallout universe. But Metro took from it and ramped everything up by 11 with its deadly creatures and even more violent factions. Imagine just surviving the Fallout universe, but going outside the vaults would almost always demand hazmat procedures. If your mask were to be damaged on the surface, you better be damn sure to have a backup or be close to a re-entry to the Metros. Trying to survive on the not-so-healthiest of foods while scrounging together whatever meds you can is just basic survival. However, coexisting with factions will be your primary concern when not dealing with the mutants of the metros. If you do not align with most of the factions and their beliefs, you can find yourself being beheaded by the Fourth Reich, or being turned into bullet-ridden Swiss cheese by the Red Line, or hell, maybe even shanked by some rogue bandit who wanted your three bullets to buy himself some Schumwutka. Like it or not, the idea of lone wolfing it ain't gonna fly in this universe. It is a necessity to live, work, and coexist with one of these factions and their respective stations. The only way you're going to survive outside these areas is with adequate radiation equipment, ammunition, supplies, and most importantly, the skills to utilize all of them effectively, or else you'll be food for a variety of your friendly neighborhood mutants. Spiders that can eat you alive in the darkness, an assortment of beasts that will swarm you and slash you to ribbons, or venturing out far enough to where literal science experiments could assimilate you. If you're the brave, adventurous, and naive type, the surface will most likely be your untimely end if you aren't dead by radiation poisoning, or the giant creatures who basically challenge you in brute strength and with aerial and sound wave combat. These are all self-explanatory though, however just attempting to live with the Dark Ones 
ones would be out of the question. It's my hypothesis that most of the paranormal activity experienced by those in the metro is due to long distance exposure to the psychoactive effects of their brainwaves, how powerful their mind tricks are at close range. The dark ones seem to have things pretty well off when it comes to managing survival with any and all creatures besides humans, who actually fire upon them on sight when they see the dark ones, but who can really blame us humans when we see them? Every single mutated being that approaches us is out to kill, and these guys really don't look that much different from a distance as they try to attempt peace. However, just being in close proximity to them causes dead space cursor-like hysteria to where you could be killed by your loved ones, your allies, your enemies, or worse off, your own hand. And that's even when it's trying to be friends with you. Imagine if it were attempting to slaughter you, if it wanted to kill you. That won't be a pleasant brain blast. But canonically, the Dark Ones seem to attempt peace regardless, even if we bomb their race to near extinction and enslave their prodigal son in a circus. So if you think you could survive the elements, eating moldy potatoes, shrooms, and fried rat, the return of the Nazis in a deadly communist Russia, every single beast I mentioned, and not having a heart attack at just the plain side of them, ascending the surface and not having a wardrobe malfunction that results in a central service system malfunction, being crushed by Teenage Mutant Ninja Harambe, or falling a few thousand feet, or think you cannot be tricked by images of your dead relatives, or think you have an IQ large enough to withstand the dark ones just hanging out nearby you. I have one thing to say if you think you can survive all of that nuclear post-apocalyptic wasteland. Go play Fallout 76. That's about it. With Exodus releasing tomorrow and Steam missing out on the Russian apocalypse revenue, what do you think of what's to come for the franchise once Exodus is out? Did I miss out on anything that should have been covered? Did I get some information incorrect? Correct me in the comments. I'm always open to talking about these. I'm always open to talk about this kind of stuff and I want to make my channel better by being correct. Don't forget to support the channel by throwing a like and subscribe and maybe a donation on my Patreon or donate during a YouTube live stream for benefits and shout outs. Which, shout out to, Thank you for your generous donations to Wild Such Gaming. Before I go, I want to announce I'm going to start featuring fan art at the end of each one of these episodes. So if you want to showcase some of your fan art, send it to me at wildsuchgaming at yahoo.com. If you do end up getting featured on these videos, I will give you a $20 gift card to any store of your choice. I'm Zach S, aka Wild Such Gaming. Stay cheeky bricky, cheeky bricky. <laughs>